Well, we want to welcome you all out this evening to the Historic Murray First Foundation uh, lecture series. We're really blessed uh, to have Coral Broshinsky present to us this evening. Uh, Coral is a very valued member of our board. Uh, she's the historian uh, of our organization and it's just fantastic. Uh, just to let you know, uh, those of you that are on online, uh, you're registered uh, for uh, a drawing for her book that she wrote. Um, let me just grab that. Uh, it's Images of, of America series. It's part of the Images of America series uh, with a focus on, on Murray here. And uh, so it's, it's wonderful to be able to uh, have her here to present to us. She'll be talking uh, to us today. If you couldn't see the, uh, the, the screen, Leonard C. Nielsen, since I'm standing in front of it. Um, and so after uh, her re remarks, there will probably be some time potentially for some questions. And, and if that's the case, I'll, I'll wander around. And, and if there are questions from the, the online audience, uh, we'll, we'll get those and, and, and read those out loud. And at the end of the, the uh, meeting tonight, we will announce the, the winner of the, the drawing. So uh, we're looking very much forward to this and, and uh, appreciate all of you being here and all of you attending online. And we'll turn the time over to Coral. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Murray City Library and the Murray Museum History Photograph Collection uh, for what will I, I be, I will be presenting a photographic biography of the architect Leonard C. Nielsen. And I'm going to have a list of the photograph sources at the end of the lecture. And also at the end of the lecture, I will be happy to take questions from the audience. So let us begin. Leonard C. Nielsen, Murray architect, Renaissance man, and tragic hero. I am here because Mr. Nielsen was a good architect and a good man, and I think someone besides me needs to know his name. Um, as an architectural historian preservation consultant, I first discovered Mr. Nielsen's work for the Murray Clinic Hospital on East 4800 South. When I prepared a National Register of Historic no Places nomination for the Murray Downtown Historic District in 2006. I have described the clinic built in 1927 as an architectural gem. Uh, but as the Google Street View above shows, it is in need of some maintenance at the present time. In 2014, I had the opportunity to prepare an individual National Register nomination for the Murray City Diesel Power Plant on West 4800 South, which was built in phases between 1927 and 1948. Leonard Nielsen design, designed the rear half of the building, uh, as you can see on the left, a particularly attractive design for an industrial building of the period. During this research, I found that Mr. Nielsen lived in Murray during his most productive years as an architect. Although his years in Murray coincided with a number of personal tragedies and depression era setbacks, the quality and quantity of his work remained impressive. More recently in 2021, I prepared a National Register nomination for the Butler School Teachers Dormitory in the city of Cottonwood Heights. Here on the left, the Butler School Dormitory was one of two teachers dormitories designed by Mr. Nielsen in 1930 for the Jordan School District. Its twin can be found on Redwood Road in Bluffdale on the right. Researching this unique building produced an abundance of information on Mr. Nielsen's life and work. And this was mostly because of post-COVID advances in searching historic newspapers and also at numerous archives that made their collections more and more available online. I also took the opportunity to um, research 
the six or seven variant spellings of his name, I found that in addition to establishing his own architectural firm, Mr. Nielsen was also an athlete, school teacher, coach, musician, singer, composer, choir director, orchestra conductor, and gas station slash parking lot attendant, a true Renaissance man. Leonard Charles Nielsen was born in 1887 in Holiday, Utah to James and Camilla Hintz Nielsen. In addition to running a mercantile business, the Nielsen was a family of musicians. The Nielsen family band regularly performed at community functions. Young Leonard played the cornet. One of the tragedies of Leonard's life was that he outlived his two younger brothers, shown seated in the photograph on the right. On August 12, 1908, Leonard married his grade school sweetheart, Annie Matilda Baum. Annie was born in 1888 in Mill Creek. The Salt Lake Herald newspaper noted 150 friends and relations attended the wedding at the home of the bride's parents with, and I quote, rooms beautifully decorated with flowers and the lawn decorated with Japanese lanterns. This photograph was taken around the time of their marriage in 1908. Um, Mr. Nielsen um, attended the University of Utah and the newspaper article about their wedding included two other items of note. One, that Mr. Nielsen was captain of the U of U track team last season and was greatly liked by all who knew him. And two, the couple will make their home in Brigham City the coming winter where Mr. Nielsen will take charge of a school. So he graduated with a teaching degree from the normal school, which was what they called the University College for Teachers at the time. The photograph on the left is from the Nielsen family collection with a notation, Len practicing on the high hurdles. This is the only reference to him being called Len that I could find. The picture of Captain Nielsen is from the U of U Utonian yearbook. The 19 city, 1909 city directory lists him as a musician and a driver for an uncle's store prior to the move to Brigham City. Leonard taught at various Brigham City public schools uh, here he is pictured on the right with the Whittier School facul faculty and graduating students in 1913. He was the principal of the Central School before he left, and he also coached the Box Elder High School basketball team. I've always found him pretty easy to spot in a crowd because of his distinctive haircut. Around 1914, Leonard and Annie moved to Murray where they purchased a home at the corner of Center and Elm Streets on the lower right. He spent a year teaching at the Arlington School, then taught at the Hillcrest School during its transition from an eighth grade school into Murray's first high school. The building shown in the top right photograph later became Hillcrest Junior High when the high school moved across the street to the west side of State Street in the 1950s. According to his World War I registration card, Mr. Nielsen was six feet tall. So as expected, he also coached the basketball team in Murray. In 1916, Leonard decided he wanted to be an architect. He was accepted to the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, where he and Annie moved in September, 1916. A city directory of Brooklyn in 1917 listed Annie's name as the head of household, but the address was unreadable. I did find a Carlton Avenue near the Pratt Institute with brownstones, very similar to a family photograph of Leonard and Annie by the steps to a brownstone in 1917. Founded as a trade school in 1887, the Pratt Institute still exists as a prestigious college today. Although as you can see from the photographs, the main building is slightly more difficult to photograph with all the mature trees. Based on these examples of Nielsen's student work, I would definitely say that the two-year architectural course at the Pratt Institute favored neoclassicism.
During my research, I was delighted to find that the Pratt Institute's early yearbooks are available online. On the left is a photograph of the architectural drafting room. On the right is the architecture class of 1918. Mr. Nielsen can be seen at the left end of the middle row. You'll notice that the former basketball coach is bending his knee slightly, probably so he doesn't appear taller than his classmates standing on the platform behind the chairs. Here's a picture of his diploma for his graduation in architectural design from the Pratt Institute School of Fine Arts, Fine and Applied Arts in June, 1918. After a short time working as a draftsman in New York City, Leonard and Annie moved back to their home in Murray in 1918. A 1920 article in the Brigham City News Journal gives us a glimpse of Nielsen's early life as an architect. This is from the news. The news is in receipt of a card announcing that Mr. Leonard C. Nielsen has opened architectural office in the offices in the McIntyre Building, Salt Lake City. After completing a course in architectural design at the Pratt Institute in New York City, he returned to Salt Lake City and entered the offices of Cannon and Fetzer Architects, where he had a lot of work on church chapels and school buildings. Mr. Nielsen's long experience as a school teacher gives him a comprehensive knowledge of how school buildings ought to be constructed. The author's observation would later prove to be spot on. I could not find any examples of his uh, design work in the early 1920s, but in the Murray High Crest yearbook for 1920, there is a drawing of a proposed science and auditorium building with a caption reading, Our Dream. Of note, the building shows a surprising subtle use of classicism. And unfortunately, this design was never built. In February, 1922, Leonard C. Nielsen was licensed as an architect in Utah, as seen on the left. The photograph on the right is the McIntyre building at 68 South Main Street, where Mr. Nielsen rented office space on the fifth floor for over two decades. The McIntyre building is still standing and was listed on the National Register in 1977. The Nielsen firm appears to have been a one-man operation for most of that time. Although he may have hired help intermittently during his busy seasons, I could find no record of any draftsman or apprentice who worked at his office. His early work may have been mostly private residences, which were rarely documented in the local newspapers. What I do know about his residential work comes from photocopies of a scrapbook that Mr. Nielsen himself put together. And here are three examples. I could not locate dates or addresses for the Redondo Avenue home on the top left or the Larson residence in the center photograph. I will probably keep looking for that one because I would love to know if it still exists somewhere in Sandy. On the lower left is the Lois Anderson Hinckley home. <clears throat> this home was built up on the East Bench on 2700 East in Salt Lake City. Lois Hinckley was the last wife of Bryant Hinckley and the stepmother of an adult, Gordon B. Hinckley. Mr. Nielsen also had a talent for marketing himself. In 1928, he published an advertisement in the Murray Eagle titled, For the Love of Murray, with architect plans for comfortable, convenient, moderately priced homes, especially designed for Murray City and vicinity. Complete plans and specifications were offered at a nominal fee from the architect. I would love to someday find one of these charming English cottages that was actually built in Murray. The country residence of Scott Zimmerman on the left is located on Cottonwood Lane, not far from Walker Lane in Holiday. The house still exists, and although tripled in size, the older section is visible just above the large wall and the formidable gate. The center photographs are of the colonial revival style house Leonard designed for himself and Annie in 1929. It is located in Murray on 208 Elm Street, just east of their first home in Murray, which they sold in 1920. Nielsen also designed a house in Preston, Idaho for a Dr. Worley, and that home still survives, although the entry as a later second story. Which brings us 
to Mr. Nielsen's institutional design work and the question, what was he doing in Preston, Idaho? In 1929, he produced two designs for a new hosp hospital in Preston. The design on the right was the one that was built and the built building is in the bottom photograph. This modest neoclassical building was demolished in 1971 and replaced by a larger hospital complex. We're going to return to Murray to take a second look at Nielsen's first hospital design, the Murray Hospital Clinic, built for Dr. Haran Nishan Sharanian in 1927. Dr. Sharanian grew up in Murray and graduated from Murray schools. He returned to establish the clinic and emergency hospital after receiving his medical degree. These black and white photographs unfortunately do not show off the beautiful brickwork along the parapet of the building. In a 1909 article in the Salt Lake Tribune, Jack Goodman, the paper's architectural critic, mused that the elaborate design may have been a nod to Dr. Sharanian's Armenian heritage. Mr. Nielsen also designed a residence for Dr. Sharanian that was never built. The successful, very successful Dr. Sharanian eventually moved his family to Beverly Hills, but the building is still commonly known as the Sharanian Clinic. The same year Mr. Nielsen designed the Sharanian Clinic, he also designed the first phase of the Murray City Diesel Power Plant. The Southwest Quadrant was built in 1927 and is a relatively elaborate design for an industrial building. The building illustrates many reoccurring themes of Mr. Nielsen's work in public buildings. An easy to construct box-like mass, modest ornamental brickwork, and delicate details in the tall round arch windows. These designs are not only beautiful and functional, but probably were coming close to budget for his taxpayer funded projects. When Murray City needed to expand the plant in 1937, they hired an engineer to essentially mirror Mr. Nielsen's original design, which is now the south half of the building. The north half built in 1948 duplicates the Nielsen windows to the east and west and extends the two-tone brickwork of the original design. The landmark neon sign was added in the 1950s. Uh, Mr. Nielsen worked on this project and many others with Curtis Shaw, who was a brick mason who lived in Murray, and he was later um, mayor of Murray. And that may be a future lecture. Oops. I, I had a chance to photograph the interior of the power plant in 2014, and I've included two photos for the curious voyeurs out there. Murray City told me they would retain one of the diesel generators uh, for history. So that is shown on the left. I believe it's just being used for storage right now. Another great de Murray design from Mr. Nielsen is the Salt Lake County Fire Station built in 1931. This was a complicated project requiring the architect to not only build a new fire station at the south end of the existing Salt Lake County shops and equipment storage building, but to design a new facade to integrate the two sections and wrap around basically what was an old, um, the old Anderson planing, planing mill, which you can just barely see above the first floor there. Uh, Salt Lake County sold the fire station in Murray City in 1958, at which they used it for a fire station. And then BMW of Murray purchased the building from Murray City in 1974. Even though the BMW dealership has remodeled the building several times, they have still retained Nielsen's strong design for the elaborate parapet, which has elements of the Spanish colonial revival and mission styles. And unfortunately, they painted it. The small size of his firm may have kept Mr. Nielsen from receiving larger public commissions. In 1928, he entered the competition to design Kingsbury Hall for the University of Utah. I don't have a copy of his design, but he lost to the firm of Anderson and Young, and I see their winning design is on the left. It may have been some consolation to him that the design of his former employers, Cannon and Fetzer, was also rejected. The same year, Nielsen's designed um, a competition designed for the University of Utah Union building, shown here on the right, 
which later became the park building. This is his drawing and he received a prize for $250, but the design was not selected. In the category of no job too small was Mr. Nielsen's design for a comfort station. In other words, a men and women's restroom to be located under the front steps of the first Murray City Hall building. This is shown on the left as, as it was built in 1907 on State Street. And you can see on the right that the steps have just been changed enough for uh, restrooms to be put under the steps. And the Murray City Hall was uh, demolished in 1958 when Murray City moved their city hall to the south of uh, 53rd. The same, oh, through his most productive decade as an architect, Leonard Nielsen experienced several family tragedies. Annie, who had suffered health problems all her life, was unable to have children. They adopted a little girl, Anna Camille, in 1922, who died in 1923 at the age of one year and four months. A second adopted daughter, Rose Marie, lived only a few months before her death in 1926. Five years later, Annie Nelson died on June 1st, 1931 at the age of 42. A few days after the funeral, Leonard wrote to the Murray Eagle to express a deep appreciation for the kindness and sympathy extended by family and friends during the sickness and death of my dear wife and companion, Annie Baum Nielsen. Annie and her daughters are buried at the Wasatch Lawn Memorial Park in Mill Creek. And I didn't have pictures of the little girls. The same year he lost Annie, Leonard was finally able to realize his dream to design an auditorium building for Murray High School. The 1931 design was much simpler than the 1920 version as shown on the left. His personal photograph of the construction building is on the right. According to the Murray Eagle, the building is symmetrical in design of modified Renaissance lines and will appear equally attractive from all approaches. An aerial photograph taken in 1945 on the left shows the three high school buildings from left to right. Nielsen's Auditorium, the 1911 main building, which was formerly a grade school, and the 1914 gymnasium. These three buildings were still in use when I attended Hillcrest Junior High School in the early 1970s. Around the same time, the photograph on the right was taken of a Murray parade with the auditorium in the background. At the time I was there, a new auditorium had been built down the hill, but the main floor of the old auditorium was still used for classes. The Murray High School 19 yearbook of 1931 has not one but two pictures of the new auditorium. And the picture that was particularly interesting to me was the interior that showed the auditorium with the horseshoe balconies. When I attended Hillcrest Junior High, the balcony was condemned and off limits to students. So naturally my friends and I spent many hours hanging out in the balcony. Because why? Because we were stupid. The auditorium was demolished around the time I started at Murray High School. Another large educational project was the Webster School in Magna, Utah. Nielsen's design in 1927 for an addition to the existing 1912 building was such a good match that he drew a line on his personal photo to show where the quote, new part, mine, $40,000, was located. The school was closed in 1995 and sat vacant for many years while the community tried to consider another use for it. Unfortunately, it was destroyed by arson in 2004. In 1929, Mr. Nielsen designed a multi-purpose building for the Jordan School District. Placed next to the South Jordan Elementary School, the South Jordan Auditorium was designed for use as a school auditorium and a community center. Again, the design exhibits a simple elegance that would not break the budget of a local school district. If you're familiar with South Jordan in the past three decades, you'll understand 
the population explosion that they have had. The Jordan School District made plans to move the elementary school and rebuild it. And a draft National Register nomination was prepared for the building in 2003 in hopes that a new use could be found for the vacant historic auditorium. Unfortunately, the city of South Jordan, who had taken ownership, objected to the nomination and the building was demolished by early 2006. Leonard Nielsen's contract with the Jordan School District in 1929 also included the twin teachers dormitories in Butler and Bluffdale. To give you an idea of what Butler might have looked like in 1930, I've included a photo of Butler Hill from the 1950s. That's on the upper left. <clears throat> the school and the adjacent dormitory can just be seen at the crest of the hill on the right. Jordan School District had difficulty recruiting teachers who wanted to drive up Fort Union Boulevard in the winter. Bluffdale was even more remote and sparsely developed, and the Bluffdale dormitory is on the upper right. In my research, I discovered the buildings were mostly occupied by principals and their families, with a few teachers or other lodgers living in a second unit. The Butler dormitory has been a private residence since the 1960s, but is well preserved. You can still see details, you can still see details of Nielsen's attention to detail on the interior, like the brickwork. And um, the Butler School's teacher's dormitory was listed on the National Register in 2023. The institution that gave him the best scope for his talent and imagination was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This chapel was built in 1929 for the Deseret Ward near Delta, Utah. The L-shaped building features a colonial revival style entry under an unusual octagon tower. Unfortunately, the building was constructed on the banks of the Severe River and was damaged by floodwaters in 1983. I thought, what a timely reference since we are looking for, forward to similar flooding this year. The church, restore, the church was restored by the community in 1984, but was replaced by a new church sited well away from the river just a few years later. It was demolished in the 1990s. Nielsen created a slightly more elaborate version of this design for the Midvale Second Ward, also in 1929. The design is particularly interesting for its equally elaborate north elevation. The south elevation is the L. Um, so north elevation you can see on the lower right slide. Um, the Midvale Second Ward still stands on Main Street in Midvale, although no longer houses an LDS congregation. I wanted to include a screenshot of the newspaper notice for the construction, just as a reminder that sometimes both his first and last names were incorrectly spelled. I can empathize with Mr. Nielsen. One of the most humbling surprises of my re recent research is that I didn't realize he also designed the Murray First Ward editions in 1928. On the upper left is the Murray First Ward as it was originally built in 1906-1907. The 1961 photos show the auditorium and classroom addition to the east and the stake offices to the west. You can appreciate how the architect designed the subordinate additions with a nod to the Victorian Gothic style of the original building. The church was listed on the National Register as a contributing resource in the Murray Downtown Residential Historic District in 1925. Our foundation's namesake building was demolished in March 2020. Although Mr. Nielsen had a lot of work in the late 1920s and early 1930s, Annie's death left him with medical debts and the impacts of the Great Depression that were beginning to start being felt in Utah. After trying to rent his Elm Street house, Leonard not only lost his home with Annie, the Elm Street, Elm Street house, but also the modern English type home he designed at 4933 South Center Street. The auction sale notice I found, while sad, provides another tin, tidbit of information <clears throat> when it proclaims, this is one of the very choicest small homes in the state of Utah, designed by an architect and took third prize in the Better Homes contest for small homes in America.
Mr. Nielsen's situation was so dire that the owner of the McIntyre building, William McIntyre, allowed Mr. Nielsen to live in his office rent free beginning in 1932. He lived in the office for about four years and he started paying rent in 1984 as soon as he was back on his feet. But there was still a lack of work, architectural work during the early depression years. And so he had a lot of spare time but he remained busy. Uh, he spent a lot of time on his music. He appears in the local newspapers as the ward choir and orchestra director for the Murray First Ward, which I assume meant that he kept a connection to the Murray neighborhood. He was also the music director, a composer, and a soloist for the Cottonwood State Quarterly Conferences in the 1930s. Mr. Nielsen also frequently spoke at architectural conferences as a member of the American Institute of Architects. He spoke on fire safety and other subjects, uh, but especially the need for secondary stairways for apartment buildings, not just metal fire escapes. The situation took a turn for the better in 1934 when Mr. Nielsen received a telegram from Washington, D.C., offering him a, a position as a resident engineer for the Public Works Administration, the PWA. This was the government make work program specifically designed for the construction of public buildings. And he accepted the position. He eagerly accepted the position. He oversaw building projects across the state as noticed in various newspapers. I found him uh, working in Nebo School District, Price and Parowan. He was also associated with PWA work at the Utah State Hospital in Provo, which we know as the mental hospital and the State Training School in American Fork. So I have three buildings, the two on the left and one on the upper right projects from Provo, and then the training school on the lower right. And I don't know if he personally designed any of the three, any of these buildings, uh, because that isn't recorded in the newspaper articles I found. Um, but at least he was working. And I thought particularly some of the buildings on the training school looked like they had his style. There was work for the PWA ended in 1936. And it was a good year that proved very happy because of his marriage to Hazel Cecilia Christensen. Hazel was born in Colorado in 1901. Leonard and Hazel were married in October 1936 and they had one son, Leonard Elwood, born in 1938. On the right is Hazel's engagement announcement photograph. The middle photo is her with an adorable Elwood. The picture on the left is the Barbara Worth Apartments on South Temple in Salt Lake City. Leonard and Hazel moved into an apartment on the first floor of the Crest Home Apartments. This was an apartment block similar to the Barbara Worth and was next door to it. The Barbara Worth apartment still stands, but the Crest Home was de demolished after a fire in the 1970s, and I utterly failed to find a photograph of it. Just prior to World War II, Leonard Nielsen had two large commissions from the LDS Church, a meeting house in Butte, Montana, and one near Los Angeles, California. A 1941 article in the Deseret News featured renderings for both projects, seen on the left, the first, the top and the middle uh, rendering. On my slide though, I did want to include the other one on the article, which is at the bottom. It was the addition of the South Cottonwood Ward. It was also in 1941 in Murray that was located on Vine Street near the cemetery. However, Mr. Nielsen was not the architect for this project. He again lost out to Hanson and Young. The photographs on the right are of the Butte Ward in 1955, as it was built, and in 2019, still standing, but no longer an LDS church. The Walnut Park Meeting House was designed for a community just a few miles south of Los Angeles in 1941. In the 1958 photograph in the center, you can just make out the crisscrossing brickwork at the top of the tower. And I wish I had a better picture. I wish I had a color picture because this building survives no longer as an LDS church, but it's uh, serving another congregation and they just painted it all white. Somebody painted it all white. Mr. 
Mr. Nielsen also designed seminary buildings for high schools in Logan and Parowan, Utah. The left photographs represent two views of the Logan Seminary building. Leonard's notation on the photograph reads, William M. Bohm, I presume a relative of Annie's, standing by my Ford. The car was really important, I think. This building was demolished in 1967 and replaced by a modern style building in 1968. The very formal Logan building is a contrast to the Parowan High School Seminary on the right, which has a more domestic look. It was built in 1940. Its replacement was built in 1970, and that building was later replaced by a new building in 1993. One of the prettiest buildings I found in my research was the Vernal High School Seminary. On the left is the building under construction in 1937, and I just love that since it's in Vernal, there's a horse standing in front of the foreground of the picture. The completed building is on the right, looking so beautiful and so very unlike the recent seminary buildings preferred by the LDS Church. Assuming it had been demolished, I went looking for it anyway. I looked in several wrong places, not realizing it had been converted to the Murray, excuse me, the Vernal Junior High Seminary. But lo and behold, I found it was still standing and still beautiful, although the lower windows had been replaced. Today, the building is owned by the LDS Church and used for distribution services. The Vernal High School Seminary made it to the tippy top of my favorite building list when I discovered the LDS Church History Library had an original color rendering of the building the first and only one I have ever seen of Mr. Nielsen's work. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and have a drink of water while you appreciate his artistry. This section of my lecture, I labeled the versatility years, 1939 to 1948. And the name versatility came from a title of a Salt Lake Telegram article published in 1946. A little background, in 1939, Leonard Nielsen was still having trouble making ends meet with architectural design work alone. His solution was to build a small service station and parking lot on leased ground that had been recently cleared on Regent Street in downtown Salt Lake City. So a whole bunch of old buildings were, um, were, are being demolished in 1938. So the Salt Lake Telegram article begins with the questions, do you need plans for a new home or business? Would you like to hear a piano concert? Or would you just like to park your car? Come over and see Leonard C. Nielsen at his office in the Central Auto Park on Regent Street. There in a small one room headquarters, Mr. Nielsen has a combined architect's den, music conservatory, and a business office. So as I understand it, the piano was on the ground floor with the, with the office and the um, his architectural studio was on the second floor. And I just had to find a picture of that building. So this is the Central Auto Park in 1939. Um, and on the left is a picture of it with at the end of the rows of cars. And then you can see there's the sort of two-story building and a second building that was a garage uh, that was used for oil changes and other services. And this is his personal photo with apparently him sitting outside the service station. So, whoops, let me stay on this for a minute. Uh, Leonard retained his office in the McIntyre building while his youngest brother managed the service station and parking lot. After his brother's death, Leonard gave up his office and took over management of the Central Auto Park. Here are his personal photos, him sitting in front of the building on the right. Yeah. This tax assessor photograph from about 1936, um, to about 1940 should be, shows the matching garage for oil changes. Um, it's a little easier to see in this picture. And I found it interesting that the Salt Lake Telegram was so interested in Mr. Nielsen's versatility that they did a second feature, um, a second article on the subject in 1948, this time with a picture caption, Father Checks Over Piano Scales. 
So this is a picture of Leonard with his son, Elwood, uh, while he's getting his piano lessons in, at the service station. The article quotes Hazel saying, or describes Hazel saying, her husband's business establishment had solved the problem of how to keep the neighbors in an apartment house from complaining about the piano, in addition to bringing more pleasure into her husband's working hours. In between checking oil pressure and filling gas tanks, Leonard found time to draw in a second floor workshop and compose music at the piano. In 1948, Leonard and Hazel Nielsen and 10-year-old Elwood moved to Torrance, California. Although one brief biography stated that he continued design buildings, I couldn't find any examples from this period. I did wonder if the family attended church in the Walnut Park Ward that Leonard designed in 1941. It was only a 20 minutes drive away from Torrance, and but that's today's traffic. I imagine in the 1950s, it was much faster to get there. Leonard C. Nielsen lived in Torrance until his death on July 26, 1954, at the age of 66. He was buried in the Wasatch Lawn Memorial Park near Annie and the Girls. Hazel Nielsen Huntington remarried in 1961 and died in St. George, Utah in 1998. Their son, Leonard Elwood Nielsen, was interviewed um, by the preservation consultant who did the South, uh, excuse me, the South Jordan Auditorium nomination and was able to give those personal photographs and are grateful for him that he was able to give that interview probably around 19, uh, 2003 before his death in 2005. So that's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So you wanna turn the lights back on too. you have any questions? Uh, so I am anticipating this crowd is going to ask me um, if Annie Matilda Bohm is re is um, related to Wayne and, and Sharon Bohm. And yes, I went and looked and he's like um, a sec, he's like a third cousin or a first cousin three times removed. So, so close. Yeah. yeah. So, any other questions? So you had, I think, previously talked about him as like a storybook style. Is that correct, the architect? That he did storybook style. Well, his his English cottages and Tudor sort of Tudor cottages, and you can see there's little elements of that in most of his residential work. Um, they have been, some people call them storybook styles, but I think you need a little bit more elaborate decoration. Can you, for can you kind of, um, give like a detail of what would comprise the storybook style as like a definition? Um, yeah, let's go back to his residential work. Okay, so take, um, take for example, the Lois Anderson Hinckley home there on the, and sorry, I'm just making things difficult, aren't I? <laughs> so um, the English Tudor and English cottage styles usually have that really high pitched roof. Um, and yeah, you can, and sort of rounded arches. Um, you can also kind of see this in the dormitory buildings as well. A storybook style would take those that the massing of kind of the storybook, but they might have um, sort of uh, gable decoration, decorative woodwork under the gables or around the doors, and and um, they tend not to be seen so much in Utah because we built so many brick buildings, and brick doesn't really lend itself well to the really you know lovely scroll cut decorations that you might find on that type of building. Any other questions or? Any other, any other questions? Any questions from the viewers at home? Okay, just do that one. 
So you don't happen to know the address of this Lois Anderson Hinkley home? You said it was on 27th East. Um, yes, it it's at about, I think it was about like 20, 29. I, I've forgotten the address, but I, I can find that for you. 20, so. South of the S curve, isn't it? Is it on the S curve in Mill Creek, East Mill Creek? No, no, it's further north than that. So it's in Salt Lake. It's in Salt Lake City. It's so it's north of I eighty then. No, it's south of I eighty. I think between that. On twenty seventh east, mm -hmm. between I eighty and thirty third or something. Yeah, it's com completely gone. There, new house, a new subdivision development. Oh, I it's gone now. Yeah, it's gone. You don't oh. know. You don't know when it got turned down. Well, from the looks of the subdivision, probably the 1980s or 1990s. Okay, so it's... Yes. Okay. How many of his uh, buildings are still in Murray and still standing? Well, both of the homes he designed. Um, are still standing and I suspect uh, several other homes. I just haven't been able to track them down. Um, the only one that, that uh, of the larger buildings that I talked about that's been demolished was the Murray High School Auditorium. And so the, the Sheranian Clinic, the Murray Diesel Power Plant, um, oh, and the additions to the Murray First Ward have of course been demolished. And the Murray City Fire, or the, the fire Station also is standing. Yes, it's a massage parlor behind the 7-Eleven at the corner of 48 South and State Street. It's it's a tiny little jewel of a building. It really is. Any other questions? No. Yes. In the back. When we were talking earlier, you mentioned one of the things about Warren Lenore Leonard about the architect was that that he was a good architect who designed beautiful buildings. Can you tell me a little bit more about what makes him a good architect? Okay, and that's my husband, and I know what he's trying to get me to say <laughs> is that I do make a distinction sometimes. Uh, when... He is her husband. Yeah, that is necessarily <laughs> true. Yes is I do make a distinction sometimes between an, uh, an architect who seems more like a great artist, beautiful artistic buildings, but buildings that don't function, buildings that don't work well for the people who have to use them. They're great art, but not necessarily great architecture. I really felt in um, examining Mr. Nielsen's life and work is that he worked very hard to please his clients, to make buildings that they would appreciate and that would be functional. And um, unfortunately, education buildings, you know, are often the first to go because everybody wants their kids to attend new schools. Um, but it's nice to see uh, some of the other building types are still around. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, sorry. How did he get into so much music? Has he always been uh, trained in it, or is he just kind of natural in it? Well, his his family in Mill Creek or in Holiday had a family band where all of the children played instruments, and the, and his father was a musician as well. And they had a family band who would go around and play at functions um, in the community. And I um, and I understand he played the cornet. I don't see any um, anything that said he continued to play that instrument, but he definitely learned the piano because he was composing music right along with being an architect and and also a you know, choir director. He was a soloist he, and he was in men's quartets. So he was spent a lot of his time with music as being a big part of his life. Anyone else? Any other? No, no Zoom. Okay. Um, well, we want to 
uh, thank Coral for the wonderful presentation, very informative and uh, some interesting, interesting insights. So we can give her another round of applause for her presentation.